That, that's someone with a whistle. Don't worry about it. <laughs> is it is it live? I'm not hearing it. I'm not seeing it. Are you just? Are you? I'm live. Shall I begin? Yeah, go ahead. The sound is very bad, extremely bad. It's gotta be louder. No, 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 it's really bad. Put on both earbuds. You know, what we did, we're on the back in the backyard because in front the cars go by. It's, it's over there. at the top of <clears throat> Just make sure you talk a little louder. I will scream. Well, don't hurt yourself when you zoom in. Yeah. aren't working. They're not working. Yeah. Try saying something. Is the noise gone? Grandma, no one can hear you. The outside noise? It's not the outside noise. The earbuds aren't working. Okay, I'm moving the table. Oh, good, 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 good. Mm -hmm. um, take, take that, the other one, and put them in. I feel like Frankenstein. This might be better. Put it in, um, yeah. The one with the microphone goes in the right ear. Sorry, everybody, we are getting it. Guys, I feel like Frankenstein. <laughs> When they have him on the table, and nobody knows what to do with him. But you're cuter. <laughs> okay, try this. Everyone hears you. They hear me? Hallelujah. Okay, I'll begin again. Okay, perfect. Okay. Does that mean that the half hour begins right now? Okay. This is a drawing I made of the people who help each other in these residences. And they're both in the residence. And this one was so scared. And he said, please don't go. 
and the other one said, I'll stay with you. Okay? And I'm going to be doing one of these in every session. I'll begin with that. And I would like very much for people to call in advice that they have in what the next drawing should be. Because long ago, Harvey allowed me entrance into all the residences. And I was able to draw the people and see them. And I'm going back to the book he published and look at the pictures and make the people older, okay? Now let me go back to my paintings and why I do what I do, okay? When I lean back, can you still hear me? Okay. Just don't talk, no. I can't disconnect myself, okay. I b will always begin with this painting because the reason for my work is I try to create a world for you where you begin to pay attention to other people around you. I have a feeling right now we've come to a crucial time where nature is beginning to feel that we're a failed experiment. The hate at a time when all of us need to work together is there and it's become intensified. It would be possible for all of us to save ourselves from the virus if we were friends with each other and could help each other, but we don't. And so this is going to be the beginning of every painting that I do. And I would like you to look at it and to see, have you made an approach to somebody who you once thought was not as good as you are, okay? When I was eight years old, and I was a Jewish child in Vienna, Austria, which was a wonderful country to grow up in, and then Hitler came, and suddenly I was allowed to go in the street, I was not allowed to be in school anymore, and the segregation which all of you in America who are my age or even younger have seriously felt and are still feeling now. And my daughter once asked me, Mom, what do you really want to do? And I said, I would like to sit on a street corner with a canvas and paint. And she said, why don't you? And I said, because it's just not what middle-aged European-born women do. And I've said it before, and this is the last time I'll say this, but it's my introduction to the work that I started to do. So I don't know why the only place I wanted to go to was the Lower East Side. I did not grow up there. I did not know it. But automatically, when I came to New York, I wanted to go to the Lower East Side because I had read so much about the fact this is where immigrations came from Europe, and that's what I was doing. And I sat on the street corner. My daughter drove me down because I was afraid to drive over a bridge. I was afraid to drive in New York. I was afraid of everything. And. I sat there, and because I could understand Yiddish and Spanish, I understood everything anybody said. And that was with the first painting which I spoke about last time. Now I'm going to the second one. I spoke about it last week, but what happened was I forgot to show you the picture. So Jesse who is back again, and he's, and it's not raining, so we don't have to be in the house. He just showed, did you show it just now? Okay. It was a wonderful painting to do. And after that painting, suddenly nobody stopped me anymore. Somebody found out that somebody's gonna paint you and your family, and your business, 
and that you have the painting. And suddenly, the commissions were waiting. And you're going to talk about this painting in particular, tell stories? About number two. I had already spoken last week, but I hadn't shown the picture. So Jesse's going to show it. And then he's going to go to number three. Okay. Jesse is doing a website. And it's so much better the way he photographed them for the West Side than the photographs that I have. I have them here, but they're not as good. So, Jesse, wait, there's a fly. Go away, fly. Go away. Okay. What happened was, don't forget, we're sitting outside. And last time when we sat outside, my son Kenny had to chase birds away because they were screaming. Today, he had to find out about people who whistled. I don't know what next week will be like, but I hope we don't have rain. Okay. When I just clapped my hands, did I dislodge my hearing aid? We're good. No, I'm okay. Let me talk about the third painting. The third painting, I had gone back to where the, where the mascot painting was because in that place, I had a friend who already knew how, to, how I painted and how to explain it. And he's the guy on the bicycle. And he was the handyman there. And he was wonderful. And I spoke to an attorney about doing this. And I, he said, she said, just don't mention names because now you're going public. Just use the first name, okay? And above all, don't mention where the paintings are. So you see, I had good help. What I wrote here, I love doing this painting. By the way, the man who helped me so much was named Tony. And he's to the right side of the painting under the blue and yellow umbrella of the hot dog stand is Jimmy Rose. But Tony was holding a broom. See, I'm reading, I wrote a story with every single painting. And someday, there's a reason for it because what shocked me when I came to America was the segregation. That I, with a white skin, could go anywhere and speak to anybody, but the friends that I had made in Panama would not have been welcomed because they were different color skins. And I realized at that time, I have to do paintings to show that segregation is very stupid because we miss so much. Let me see, how much time do I have left? Lots, lots of time. Would anybody want to ask me any questions? But Grandma, could we stay with the, the second painting instead of, ah. Do you Jess want the third? The, I have Jess the third. has the third. The third is up now, so you could talk about it's it. It's the third one. Can you see Tony Silva, the one with the broom? And then go to the hot dog stand and you will see somebody who might put into many paintings afterwards. His name is Jimmy. Yes, and if you have any questions, we can stop and I can answer them. Do you want to tell okay, about let me talk we, about we Jimmy. Some people that commented. Oh, okay. So Lorraine says, Petty, we just tuned in. You are amazing. Um, how you correct the dots of life through your art. Um, let's see. Julie says, 
Hi, Hetty and Jess. We are here with you. Hugs and kisses. Then Tammy says, love the photos. Good, good job, Jesse. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then Tammy um, says, I feel like I know that street. She does. Tammy is the beginning of this for me. I met Tammy a long time ago. I was right and she asks questions and she asked me about my paintings and I said and she said how many did you do and I said 90 and she said where are they and I went through all my records because her questions were so good and I began to send her pictures and the stories so at the moment says, um, how do you decide what to paint? The painting decides on itself. I begin, and then people come, and they talk, and I keep going. But this is a very important question for me. I made a new friend to Hernan, who sent her to me, and she asks questions. And she kept on saying, why the Lower East Side? You weren't born there. You never lived there. Why? And it's just a few days ago that I thought about her questions that I came up with an awesome answer. I belonged. I cannot explain belonging, but all of you, at some period of time, met somebody or ended up in a spot and you found out that you belonged. I belong to the Lower East Side in my brain, in my soul, in my heart, because it's mixed. Because the people who come there, now wealthy people come there too, but only if they have a history. Like the doctor who did painting, who asked me to do painting number two. There is something in a world of the Lower East Side, which is the beginning of America. And as I tell you, each week I'm going to go to one painting. Next week it'll be painting number four, then number five. And there are only 90 paintings, so you're going to have me with you for a long time. Okay? Shall I go back to Jimmy? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, to do Jimmy, I had to work at odd moments. His hot dogs are delicious, and he was often surrounded by customers. So I would work on the stand and the umbrella until he was alone again. And then I could see him and put him into the painting. The shapes were blocked out on the canvas, the lights, the darks, the middle tones were laid out, but to people passing by it was a large, loud mess. There were mostly polite words like, I paint too, or, or how nice to see someone painting. But since I understand Yiddish and some Spanish, I could also understand what else they said. Tony used to explain everything to people. As the painting progressed, because I had to do number one at this same spot, only doing a different part. So internally, he would tell me what people had said. But now at the beginning of the painting, after having best in the, best in the comments of, look, she's doing that window. Look, she's doing that man over there. Look, that's Orchard Street. It was very difficult to come down to, my God, what's that red spot? He didn't desert me. He would painstakingly explain everything. And I, since I still cringe when I hear the comments, at least I wasn't alone. Tony also cringed. Now, heat came. It became, how much time do I have? You're fine. You're good. Okay. The heat was so powerful. And one morning when I came, it took me a long time to do each painting. They had torn open the streets and the dust blew. 
they were doing the pipes underneath the street and the dust was blowing in any other part of the world I would have packed up and gone home but I couldn't there because people kept working and since I have this little bit of time I would like to explain the reasons for my paintings right now the virus hit and I cannot see people but neither can you and maybe you're going to begin to realize we need each other maybe the virus came from whatever powers that rule the world whatever religion you call them however you picture them maybe you picture mother nature mother nature is saying you thought you could do without see how you miss them suddenly more people shoot each other more people have domestic abuse more people are lonely think a minute what can you do about it if a virus hits you it's also hitting the whole world this time it's all of us somebody make a comment to me about how you feel about that well speaking of which you have some comments not based on this topic right now but you do have some comments yes um, so um, Jean Mariko says hello Miss Page I was your student when I was little now I'm 60 your painting hangs in my house with my family painted in it what was your name then? Uh, oh, okay. What was it? Pomarico. Um, you painted it for my mom when I was in your class. I am loving this live. Love you. Then Tammy says, you have all the time you want. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. Do you want to talk about how you met Eric? I would love to. I would love to. Okay. I didn't like America when I came because of the segregation. So I decided I cannot allow myself to stay in a land where the people that I know from Panama would not be allowed to have coffee with me. And I decided I would go to Israel and to live in a kibbutz. A kibbutz is a communal settlement in the desert. And I went, it was upstate where that kibbutz movement was, near Livingston Manor. And Eric had come to America straight from concentration camp. And he saw the segregation. And he found out that he was supposed to be not segregated because of his color of the skin which was white, but that he would have to tell other people he could not be with them. And he went to work in a factory because people who had been in concentration camp knew how to work. And he, he made a very close friend in the factory who was black. And one day he said, let's go out. You've got a girlfriend, I'll get me a girl. Let's go out. And the way Eric explained it, he stood up and he said, his friend stood up and said, look at me, Eric, I'm black. I'm not allowed to go anywhere where you can go. And it was at that moment that Eric decided he couldn't stay in America. And I met him up in that camp. Tell about how you met Eric. In that camp, we began to talk because Eric was a ladies' man. He loved women. And there was no way I was going to get involved with anybody like that. But we did talk. And he used to meet me and talk and talk. And we walked and we talked. And then one day he proposed and he said, Hedy, before you marry me, before you say yes, you have to settle with this. My life is a closed book. 
parts of it I can never speak about. Can you settle for that? And I, because I was a child of refugees and we had fled, I understood. And he said, can you forgive me? And I cannot give you a family either. They're all killed except one uncle. And we married and he taught me not to be afraid. Eric is the reason why I sit on street corners and why I work in the prison system. Because he said, if you allow yourself to be afraid of anything, then they win. Don't let them win. And I would like to say that to all of you. If you've been afraid of meeting somebody of a different color or a different religion, don't let them win. By being afraid, you let other people win. And I miss him terribly, but I'm not afraid of anything because when he passed away, he went in his own way. He stopped eating and he stopped exercising. And I have a very close friend who was one of the concentration camp survivors. And when he came home from surgery, because the concentration camp created a lot of illness in his lungs. And when he came home after the last heart surgery, I called her and I said, Irene, Eric lost his spirit. And she said, Hedy, let him go. And I said, no, I can't. He has so much to live for. And she said, okay, but when he needs to go, let him go. And I said, Eric, Eric, this is what she said. And he said, oh, she's full of. And he said, I have so much to live for, but something inside of him needed to go. And he stopped eating and he stopped exercising. And he became like a skeleton. And when he passed away and I called Irene, she said, what happened? And I said, he looked like a concentration camp survivor. And she said, because he had to go back, he had to go back and solve what he had become during that time. Because what he had begun was not who he was. And friends of my son came to visit when he was already in the last stages. And he had counseled people because he had worked in the prisons. And he knew how to counsel, pe how to counsel people because they recognized the anger that he once had carried and they felt safe with him. And one of my son's friends says, Eric, tell me again, how did you get rid of the anger? And what he said was, every time that I felt anger coming, like when somebody cut in front of me with the car, I would pull out that anger and look at it and say, is it worth it? And then I would throw it away. And I told that story at the Fortune Society, which is of prisoners from before who are now being rehabbed. And what they said was, how do you get rid of it? 
And he said, you pull it out, you look at it, and you find out, is it worth it? And they throw it away. And there came a day when I pulled the last bit out and I found myself underneath. It was gone. The person I should have been was waiting. And we were so lucky because we lived with him in that last few months and he was the person he would have been if there had never been the anger. And that's it. So Hetty, we just have a few minutes left. Do you want do you want to ask anything in the last few minutes? Does anybody want to ask anything in these last few minutes? We're all amateurs at this. But at least the birds aren't screaming. We have a lot of machines. We do. We oh, do. I have a question. You talked about the Lower East Side being your place. You don't even know why. That's such an interesting concept. How can people kind of think about what their place is, like what they're being called to? Just I think if you allow yourself to face your fears and do what you want, I think you will begin to discover your place in the world. If you have not yet discovered it, then it's worth looking for. Because I have a feeling that each one of us is wired in different ways, with multiple wires, so many of them. And it's in my generation that suddenly Suddenly the word homosexual has been divided into so many other things. And I am waiting in this period of time to find out that people are going to be allowed to step out and find who they are and to be accepted because they accept who they are. Because it's the first thing you have to accept who you are and find out who you are. I know I have a purpose. I have to change the world. How do I change it? By making you see and making you belong. Because if you don't let other people belong, you will never find out your wiring and your glory.